Good morning. I'm so glad you could join me. So, New Year's resolutions, right? Why do we make them? Well, it started in ancient Babylon about 4,000 years ago. When the Babylonians were either crowning a new king or wanted to reaffirm their continuing loyalty to the reigning king, they often made promises to the gods to pay their debts or return borrowed objects. That's how the Babylonians either fell into or out of favor with the gods, something they considered pretty important. A similar practice occurred in ancient Rome. It was Julius Caesar who actually established January the 1st as the start of the new year. Before that, it was around mid-March, had something to do with planting season. Well, he named the month January after the god Janus. And he was considered a, a two-faced god. He had special significance for the Romans. They believed that Janus symbolically looked both backwards into the previous year and ahead into the future. So they offered sacrifices to this deity in January at the beginning of the new year and made promises of good conduct for the coming year. Now for early Christians, the first day of the new year became the traditional occasion for, for thinking about one's past mistakes and resolving to do and to be better in the future. It was actually John Wesley in 1740 who created the Covenant Renewal Service. And this was mostly held on either New Year's Eve or New Year's Day and was often spent praying and making resolutions for the coming year. Now since their inception, New Year's resolutions have been made because in our heart of hearts, we all know that we need to do and to be better. Well, at least most of us do. As much as we struggle with change, we also long for a clean slate, a new beginning, we long to, to stop doing things that we know are bad for us and to, to start doing things that we know are good for us. For instance, walking on a treadmill. Being created in the image of God, we have this innate need for self-improvement. We know that we aren't living as the people that we were designed to be. James tells us that if anyone knows the good that they ought to do, and they don't do it, it's sin for them. So being driven by our, our needs for approval, for joy, fulfillment, freedom, and peace, we resolve to live differently. Now here are some of the top resolutions that people make. See if any of these resonate with you. Number one, to lose weight to eat healthy and or exercise, to pay off debts, to save money, to quit a bad habit or give up an addiction. God designed us to be stewards of everything that he gives us and all that we have comes from him. He's designed us to be stewards or managers of, of our bodies, our time, our, our finances and our relationships. The heart of all these resolutions reflects this design. Now, I don't have the Canadian stats, but I'm pretty sure they're, they're quite similar to the ones in the States. In America, 46% of adults make New Year's resolutions. And of those 46%, nearly half the population, only 8% keep them. It seems that for most of us, New Year's resolutions are merely a to-do list for the first week of the new year. We soon find ourselves too weak to go on. Sure, willpower will help us do many things, but real change takes place in the heart. Many people who no longer drink or smoke or eat cookies still long for those things. Behavior is a symptom of an unmet need. We do things that are bad for us and neglect things that are good for us because of an emptiness within our hearts. Rather than making resolutions, what we need is a transformation, change 
from the inside out. You know, I find it fascinating just how many temptations have to do with food, even in the Bible. Think about it. The very first sin was Adam and Eve eating something they were told not to. They were like, like children whose mother just made cookies, put them out to cool, and gave strict instructions not to touch them while she went to the shops. Well, sure enough, the kids ate the cookies. And we haven't been able to keep our hand out of the cookie jar ever since. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, the first thing the devil tried to get him to do was to turn stones into bread. Now, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. To say that he was hungry was an understatement. But his answer was this. No one can live only on food. People need every word of God. Here is the key to our transformation. The word of God. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that Jesus is the word made flesh. With his spirit to strengthen us and his word to guide us, we will live differently. Only Jesus can fill that empty space inside. The one that we keep trying to fill with food, drink, drugs, sex, fame. You fill in the blank. All these things only make that hole in our hearts grow deeper. We are indeed addicted to more, as my nephew once said. Only Jesus can give us the approval, the fulfillment, the joy, the freedom, and the peace that we crave so desperately. When we're struggling to say no to temptation, Jesus can give us comfort and hope and strength and courage. Jesus has been through everything that we go through. He gets it. And he alone can help us. He designed us. He knows what we need way better than we do. He wants what's best for us. Not just what's good or what feels good. He wants us to have deep abiding joy, not just momentary happiness. We only need to come to him, to trust him enough to surrender our lives into his hands. One of the greatest temptations that we face in life is to do it ourselves. Hence the New Year's resolutions. We want a hand in all of this. In order to feel good about ourselves, we want that sense of accomplishment rather than just accepting that we're loved and valued as God's precious creation. We want to be able to point to something that we've done and say we deserve. But therein lies the rub. The more we try, the more we fail. The belief that we can meet our own needs to change our own hearts or make our own lives better? That's the great lie that is at the heart of every sin. All that separates us from our Creator. And you know what? Apart from Him, we can do nothing. If we were able to do the smallest thing, like, like say no to that food we weren't supposed to eat, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die for us. Without God, our hearts are bent towards sin, towards self-centeredness, self-indulgence, self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, selfishness. And all of this leads us further and further away from God, from the only one who can, can give us what we long for. He is the only source of life and of all that we seek. And because he loves us so much, he doesn't want to be separated from us. God made a way for us. When we trust Jesus to take away our sins, he fills us with his spirit. And as I'm sure many of you have heard me say before and will hear me say again, it's, it's like you have a glass of dirty water and you can't dump it out. 
But if you keep pouring the clean water in, the dirty water will be displaced. And there will be no more room for it. It'll, you'll be full. In him, we can do all things. His grace, his undeserved favor, it's all we need. When we put our lives in his hands, we can rest. <laughs> when we get out of the way, when we admit that, that we're weak, that we're powerless to change ourselves, God is able to show his strength. It's all about relationship, an intimate relationship of total trust. All we need to do is to stay close to Jesus. We lift our hearts to him in prayer. We get near to his heart in the word. And then like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, we'll be transformed. Having our deepest needs met, our desires will be different. We won't want those things that are bad for us anymore. And we'll want the things that are good for us enough to actually go after them, to do them. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, our behavior will change and our lives will be made new. We will be new creations. But that doesn't mean that all at once we're going to be perfect. Obviously, I still have things to work on. But I have experienced Jesus' life-changing power. He has set me free from so many things in my life and he has changed me so much from the inside out in dramatic, powerful ways. And any of you who know me for any real length of time know that to be true. As Joyce Meyer says, I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay and I'm on my way. We're all looking for new beginnings. We all need that clean slate. And I thank God that in Jesus, I can have those things anytime I need them. God is the God of fresh starts. So if you're, if you're thinking about New Year's resolutions, about making some, or about ones you maybe should have made, or about ones that you've already failed on, I want you to be encouraged. As T.S. Eliot said, every moment is a fresh beginning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are gracious and merciful. Thank you, Father, that because of Jesus, every moment is a new beginning. Thank you, Father, for forgiving us. Thank you that you give us the strength to live differently. You change our hearts when we put our trust in you. Help us today, Lord. If we haven't put our trust in you as our Lord and Savior yet, then help us, God, to make that important, vital, life-changing decision. Help us, Lord, to cry out to you and to say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Change me, Lord. Make me a new creation today. And if we have, then, Father, I pray that we would we would give our lives to you anew every moment that you would search our hearts and show us those things that we're holding on to, that we're clenching on to, that are slipping through our fingers, that we need to let go of and trust you with. Father, I pray that every moment with you would be a new beginning and a fresh start, that you would keep taking us, Lord, into deeper faith and a closer walk with you. In Jesus' name. God bless.